Are you part of a nonprofit organization, a youth group looking to raise cash for your cause? Stay tuned at the end of this video to learn how you can bring the action and excitement of the Millennium Wrestling Federation to your town live, featuring the superstars and legends of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Mick Foley. This is Harley Race. This is Shelton Benjamin. This is Mr. Wonderful Paul Lorndorf. This is the Monster Abyss. And this is Daniel Bryan. This is JBL and you're watching the MWF. Be there live. July, it's America's birthday, Tony. We're back again. Last year, we, we talked about Leon White on the 4th of July, and now we have, uh, it's almost like we adopted someone here. It's kind of an, an odd setting, but yeah, like I said, I think soon I'm going to be out, and he's going to be over here. I don't know. But happy birthday, America. Now, see, Tony's being difficult. We're taping a series of, sad. <laughs> of episodes on this day, and sometimes Tony goes off topic, and what we plan to maybe be a 10-minute segment goes 25. What we might plan to be a half an hour show goes an hour and a half. We never know with our good friend, the Hall of Famer, Tony Ellis. But I know more than I anyone. I never celebrate the 4th of July. Why? The last we damn thing I want to think about is 1776. <laughs> you don't celebrate the 4th of July up in Maine? Oh, they're, 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 I don't celebrate the 4th. Yeah. I don't celebrate Halloween. Why Halloween? I know you don't like ghosts. I don't like spooky wooky. And then 1776 made me think of slavery. Yeah. Because that's where I would have been. Yeah. I just go down to the beach and watch the fireworks. Well, I know you're all over social media on boats. Is that what you're going to do to yeah. later on tonight for the 4th of July? Probably, yes. I'll be on my boat and. I'll be going get... around. Yell yeah, some balls. Yell yeah, some. Yeah. Why aren't you going over to Old Orchard Beach, Tony? For what? Pose. My tan Sells is okay. Sells made by tens. I got a good suntan. All right. No one's I got to get my tan that. working. You do. My, yeah, you my do. tan is yeah, not that tan. good right now. Next yeah, time you need... here, you got to be more tan and actually wear pants. We it's been raining every single table. week, as we've been Did talking we, about. We were, we were, <laughs> I'm already at the time, but talk about an awful spring here in New England. It's been awful. I don't think we had a spring. The other day, I said, what's next month going to be, April? But anyway, we're going <laughs> to introduce this Big Memories and Legends episode coming up. Demolition Axe and I begin to discuss the year that was 1989 in the World Wrestling Federation. What a great episode it was. We're taping this after the fact, obviously, as I have different clothes on. But we will always like to give the fans a happy 4th of July. Our good friend uh, from the Boston bad boy, Tony Rumble Century Wrestling Alliance, the Jackal, who's no longer with us, uh, the voice of the CWA, is certainly a wrestling historian. He loved the 4th of July. He did a big celebration every year. So for our friend, the Jackal, who spent many years in this studio, we wish he was here with us, Tony. Nothing... Makes you happy on the 4th of July, though. No. Not the fireworks, the cookouts. Nothing. What about a good barbecue? You I don't, don't celebrate it. You know, right. What do you do on the 4th of July? Watch TV. And sit here with me. Watch my old westerns. Well, last year, we talked about how much Leon Randolph White... Scott, the best cowboy movies ever made. <laughs> we talked about how much Leon... You ever seen Randolph Scott? I have no Butter idea John Wayne. Everybody talking about John Wayne. What about Wayne? Susan B. Anthony? They don't make nut down here. All right, that's probably the best. <laughs> you don't, you don't see nut down on Last the year on the 4th of July, we talked about how much Vader, Leon White, stunk after he passed away with his reputation for not cleaning his gear. I enjoyed last... <laughs> I was in Las Vegas for the UFC fight, and here I am with you yet again. Tremendous. Which one is worse? Who? Leon Be or Las Vegas? Be with me or Leon with the stinky gear? When Leon was here in the studio... You knew Leon was here in the studio. Oh, my God. And I like Leon, so I'll leave it at that. And Randy Savage was the same way. I only met him one time. I, I walked know. into his dressing room one day, and I almost gagged. Did they call him Leon White or Leon Wright? <laughs> I don't know. All right, wrestling fans, stand by for Memories and Legends. <laughs> wrestling fans around the corner, around the world, welcome to another installment of Memories and Legends. It is season three. I'm Dan Marotti. 
He's not Tony Atlas. He is the legendary Bill one Eady. half Bill Eady, Demolition Axe, one half of the greatest tag team in WWE history. I don't care what you say. I will defend it and fight it to the bone, Bill. Oh, thank you. There's some great contemporaries there, but I think Demolition is the creme de la creme when it comes to tag team wrestling mm -hmm. in WWE. Never mind the career you had as another wrestling legend, the Masked Superstar. Thank you. But we've unmasked you. I feel more comfortable this way. All right. Well, it's kind of hot under the lights with the mask on. Yeah, right? it is. There you go. All right. It is WWE Stomping Grounds pay-per-view weekend. It's a new pay-per-view from WWE. They pushed it back a little later in the month because of the big show in the Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. So we're here to talk about a fascinating time. We're going to go back in the time clock. We're going to reverse. It's almost going to be like driving through Canada. You're going to think you're back in the good <laughs> old days. We're going to go back 30 years to 1989. Do you remember what you were doing 30 years ago right about now, Bill? Because we're going to talk about it if you don't. I was probably on the road someplace, either in a car, uh, a jet airplane, or a locker room. I'm going to Somewhere. Guess, I'm going to guess definitely a locker room was involved. Okay. 1988 came to a close. WWE was still riding high. And folks, if you're not familiar with WWE, known as WWF, it's the same company. I, it took me about 10 years to get over saying WWF. Yeah. I hated the name WWE. I hate that name, but well, that's a different story for different You're not a, evidently not a fan of World Wildlife Federation. I, no matter how you want to, <laughs> you know what? I would have changed the name. I like WWX when they had to change it in 2002. I don't like the name WWE, but that's just me. Well, it was done for another reason. We've talked about that before. Yes, so. absolutely, absolutely. All right, fans, 1989, is 88 came to a close. Again, professional wrestling was white hot for WWE. Uh, the NWA was still, it hadn't tanked yet, um, but the promotions are dying. It was the, pretty much the end of world class, whatever they had, life was, going to expire. AWA, the same thing. Their business was down across the board. But in WWF, I don't think it could be hotter. Macho Man Randy Savage came yeah. into 89 as the world champion. Ultimate Warrior was the intercontinental champion. And you and Smash, Barry Dasso, were the tag team champions uh, in a feud stemming from a double turn that took place at Survivor Series 88 right. with, with uh, Fuji. Powers of Pain and Master Fuji, who wound up with Powers of Pain when he turned his back on you. Your memories as this double turn took place, heading into 1989, working a lot with a younger warlord and barbarian. Well, you know, you and I and Barry have talked about this, and I know that we've covered a number of times. I think the, the powers of be jumped the gun a little bit. Uh, when we went out to the ring, I think the people accepted and liked our style, being very, very aggressive and uh, taking no prisoners and they just started cheering for us and I think that they were listening and they misunderstood the cheers the cheers were of appreciation of our effort not fondness which they office took misunderstood I think there was fondness I was yeah. a big big fan well I, I think the people liked us but the I think the office thought that, oh my God, they're good guys and we have to make them good guys. Well, they didn't have to. I think that once, once the music started, even before we came through the curtain, people knew they were going to be entertained and they were anticipating excitement. Well, that doesn't make you a, a baby face. It just means that they like you and they could like you kicking the shit out of somebody as well as you know, being a good guy and crossing the T's and dotting the I's. You lost Fuji, but you didn't change the style. You just worked bad guys instead of good guys. I learned there that, was not much of a change. Yeah, I learned that anyway. years ago uh, as a mass superstar. Uh, Ole Anderson and was a, a, a good friend of mine and gave me some good advice. Uh, George Scott, of course, gave me the character. And he said, don't change your style just because people like you, or just because you come out of a different dressing room. They like you because of what you are now. Now you're coming out of a different dressing room, and they're going, Whew, I'm glad these guys are on our side. But if we'd have come out and done hip tosses, and arm drags, and 
it wasn't our character. Told jokes and the promos. Yeah, it's the same and... thing with Mass Superstar. If I'd have come out and, and not done this, the things that I did before, they, the people have seen through it. I think the people liked us for what we were, and they appreciated what we did, and that's what they expected. And you delivered it. Yeah, I think I hope so. The feud with Warlord and the Bavarian, it went on for, you got about a good six or seven month run out of it initially. What was it like to work with those guys? I good think guy. Warlord was a bit younger than Barbarian. Both good guys. Uh, Warlord was a little inexperienced, we call green, but he would give his all, give 110%. Barbarian was established, uh, excellent, uh, and like we had talked about earlier. Neither team had an ego where we have to look good, you have to look bad. Both teams wanted to have a good match. And uh, we strived, and, and it wasn't achievable every night, but we strived to have the best match possible, hopefully the best match on the card. Now, that didn't always happen, but we still try, tried to do it. But they were, they were, and, and we, I, we just saw them. We were at a signing at a charity event in Pittsburgh uh, mm -hmm. two weeks ago. No, you weekend, mentioned that, yeah. And they were there. And it was nice to see them. Nice, nice, it's nice when you run into old friends and, yeah. and you bump into people that you're not friends with, but you can still be cordial and you just you say hi. Have, and you don't have go to in the other direction. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to go through a lot of the names, the faces, the events that you guys sent questions in via Twitter and via Facebook. That's the great thing. We can talk to fans from around the corner and around the globe. Yeah. It's a great medium to have, especially when trying to build up the questions that you guys want answered here on Memories and Legends. I ask you this, Bill. Uh, the first big event of 1989, even though it was taped in 88, was Saturday night's main event on January the 7th. His some names that might not come up too, too much, but... You had Red Rooster Terry Taylor turn on Bobby Heenan and wind up in a feud with the Brooklyn Brawler Steve Lombardi. Now, there is someone I really didn't expect to see be put into a program with Bobby Heenan. Steve Lombardi was the proverbial prelim guy, jobber, however you want to classify him. He had a rather unique position in the, in the office. Or not t technically in the office, within that clique. Uh, some have said that he got into unique positions to get that position. You might say that. <laughs> um, but you're right. I, that would be a strange. And, and it's sad because Terry Taylor, I always regarded as a, a talented performer. Would you consider him as a red rooster, a waste of his talent? Yes. Yeah. Uh, there's a. Funny but true story, and I guess it's, my daughter was traveling with us. We were in California for a week, and I bring my uh, daughter and my wife out, and my oldest daughter was at school at the time. And Terry was on the card, and we were there for a number of days and then ready to fly back. Well, the first night, my daughter never really said anything about the business. Mm. She was inquisitive, but didn't, you know, involve information stuff. She said, Daddy, can I ask you a question? I said, sure, honey. She was younger at the time. She said, uh, that rooster guy, I said, Terry Taylor? She says, yeah. Does he really think he's a rooster? I said, no, honey, he's just, he's just portraying a character. She said, I don't think that's a very good character. Now, this is a, <laughs> a, kid. a young kid, 11, 12 years old at the time. She said, I don't think that's a good character. Well, if she's astute enough to recognize that, why weren't they? I was, but you know what it was? It was a rib. They do stuff because they can do it. Now, Bruce Pritchard has defended that gimmick to death, saying that it was not a rib on Terry Taylor. Why do you say, in your opinion, that it was? He didn't like him. I heard he Terry had a reputation. Uh, before you he, go, continue, just to throw it out there, I had heard um, that he would constantly pester the office looking for a job. I don't know if you knew that. Terry? He, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he had a number of jobs uh, with different offices. Oh, sure. 
So I'm sure that he, uh, and he survived for years doing that. Yeah. But it didn't take away from his ability to end the ring. Right. But Terry was abrasive to a degree in his approach to certain things. And I think that the powers that be said, we're going to show him. And there again, we talked about saying no. He could have said, no, I'm not doing that. It's demeaning. Maybe he didn't feel it was demeaning, but all the guys did, except Pritchard, I guess. But everyone had kind of had the feeling he was being shit on. Well, it's like Dusty. Poor Dusty. Why do you put Dusty in a polka dot outfit? We're going to get to Dusty as 1989 rolls along. I mean, Dusty had the credentials of the top guy. I'll say this. For all the people that scoff at Red Rooster, in 2019, when we're taping this, he's got a brand new Mattel Elite action figure coming out at Target. So he's getting a little scratch (laughs) out of it. He's getting something out of it. But did you think Brooklyn Brawler was someone you could really try and do anything with? After years of seeing him just constantly lose every time he worked. You asking me? Yeah. No. No. All right. (laughs) Simple enough. Also on that same Saturday night's main event, it was pretty much the swan song of Outlaw Ron Bass, a name you don't hear too much talked about in WWE history, but he had a lot of success in the territorial days. You know, he had a decent run with Beefcake there up until the head shaving. Why don't you think it was a long-term success for Ron Bass as someone that's done a lot of booking himself? I don't I don't really know. We've Ron used to travel with us. Oh, really? A lot. We're good friends, and we had a small uh, business venture that we did together. Barry, oh, really? So you knew him well then? Barry and yeah. I and Ron. And uh, I don't know. I mean, Ron was a true professional. He was honest. He was dedicated. There again, you know, it's not based on your ability sometimes. Uh, Barry and I talk about sometimes you can be too good. You can rough feathers that, well, I should have that spot. There's a lot of behind <laughs> no, That's it. for the Red Rose stuff. There's a lot of behind yeah. the scenes stuff that goes on. But Ron should have been involved in more programs because his work was good. It was a uh, very believable promo. Very believable promo, very believable ring effort. Who knows? One of those things that didn't work out yeah. long term. You can't work out long term with everybody. You no. never freshen up the roster, I guess, no. is one way to look at it. No. One that I found to be very surprising, I didn't even know took place, was that Jimmy Garvin was brought in for a couple of TV tapings in some kind of a promotional role. I, I never knew that. I just learned about it in doing some preparation for this. Do you remember a, an attempt to bring in Jimmy Garvin to WWF in 1989? You know, I think I, I briefly remember that, but I it don't know. It was really quick. I don't know. If that was the same time that they brought in, uh, uh, what's the name of the guy? Uh, the Freebirds, the first time or something. They brought in Michael Hayes and Gordy and uh, Buddy Roberts Buddy back Roberts. in the, the mid-80s. And yeah. that was really short, too. But this was... Uh, was it later than that? Oh, this was 1989. Yeah. And I had never heard of Jimmy Garvin even getting a tryout. Like, it wasn't even a wrestling role. It was more of a mouthpiece. He would cut promos, you know, on the podium where Mean Gene would do the interviews with the guys with the ring behind him. Well, that's, I don't remember that at all. I think it was, all, it was about probably as long as Randy Cully was smashed. It was maybe one set of TV tapes. Yeah, and I, I don't remember. It didn't work out. I, that's surprising. I just thought from, you know, wrestling annals, it was kind of interesting that Jimmy appeared like that in WWF. I'd never heard of it. But apparently you forgot about it pretty quick, too. I don't, I, perhaps I wasn't, we weren't on that taping or something. Hmm. All right, what about a big one? This one, you talk about memorable. Sometimes WWF is the anticipated as the pay-per-views were. There were some hits. There were some misses. One that everyone will remember is back in January of 1989. Houston Summit, the first Royal Rumble ever on pay-per-view. 30 men over the top rope Royal Rumble. Who draws number one? Who draws number two? But the tag team champions, Axe and Smash Demolition. I thought that was a great... Unique way. Those poor unlucky guys. Those poor unlucky guys. Yeah. And then Andre was number three. And I was never, ever happy, as happy, to see Andre coming down the aisle. Now, why is that? Because we could, instead of Mary and I beating the shit out of each other, we could beat the shit out of Andre. Do you remember <laughs> how it came to be that you guys were going to draw number one and two? I, no, I don't. 
I don't, I don't. But I think, you know what? As you remember it, we get that, speaking of last two weeks ago, every place we go, that's the uh, Royal Rumble they talk about. It, when you drew number one yeah. and two? Yeah. And I think they expected, and I think it was a two-minute segment, right? Oh, yeah. Andre came out we, two minutes later. We weren't going to stand there and look at each other and put our finger up, you know, where. So the best thing to do would just attack. And I think that shocked a lot of people, too. It did. To me, I was... Because eight, I think eight, in the background of their yeah. thinking, oh, they're going to break them up now. This is going to cause a split. But it didn't happen. No, you just went right to work on Andre when yeah. he came in. Yeah. And uh, I think I went probably halfway through that Battle Royal. Smash was ousted pretty quick. Yeah, I think in about... What was it 20 men or 30 men? 30. Yeah, so 15 minutes, and then John Stead walks down the last two or three minutes and wins it, right? Well, you know what? It didn't give him as much of a chance to get blown up, I guess. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> but it, those are interesting. I mean, yeah, I don't... To take us back. What's the preparation like for 30 men to try and organize a match like this, to have it have an ebb and flow and things like that? Well, you get caught up in the, in the forest because you're in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that probably the biggest thing with that many, if you're lasting long enough, by the time you're into the 15th guy coming down and there's 12 or so guys still in there, you're, you're constantly aware of your surroundings. Right. Because I've seen and been in some battle royals with a number of people like that that you forget and you get involved in a singles match in your mind. Right. And somebody cold cocks you from the back, or you catch a boot to the leg. I mean, there's a lot of guys that aren't alert to the fact that I'm not paying attention to you. Don't hit me in the back of the neck. Right, sure. So there's a lot of injuries that take place. Well, when I was a kid, and because of the credibility that Gorilla Monsoon had as a commentator, he'd say, this is the most dangerous match in professional oh, they wrestling. Are. And I believed it. Yeah, they They're are. not all that much fun to watch sometimes, but no. And the, it, funny enough is the day we taped this over in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, they're taping the Super Showdown, which is a 50-man battle royal. Oh, my 50 God. men in one ring is just, I don't know how they're all going to fit. Now, see, I've been in battle royals in one ring, not that many people. That's, that's ridiculous. You, you're standing right. elbow like to elbow. sardines in a yeah. can. But I've been in two ring uh, battle royals. Which is rather unique, but well, interesting again, to watch. Yeah, rather you know, there again, I've been in them where you, you get thrown out and you have to climb the other. I've been in them where you, you get thrown into the other one. That's that close. Uh, but they are dangerous. The people aren't aware of you know. You get fifty guys in there. There's probably going to be five major injuries. Literally, and I don't know if there's anyone clamoring to say, you know what, I really want to see a fifty-man battle royal. They're always big nowadays on the first ever, the first ever, the first ever. Well, sometimes there's reasons things never existed before. I, re I watched the documentary on the history of Ringling Brothers mm -hmm. and the circuses. And the great idea was the center ring. And then they had a second ring. Then they had a third ring. But there's three shows going on at one time. So the people in the middle can see parts of each one. The people at ring one can only see ring one, and maybe a little bit. So how much can you watch? Yeah, right. It's difficult to watch on video. In person, you can't make much How do you commentate on that? Right. I'll tell you this. Are you a fan of the circus? Do you have an interest in that, Ringling Brothers? Well, I, I'm a history buff, mm -hmm. history teacher. Oh, is that what you teach? I didn't even yeah, know that. I, oh, I teach special education, but I got my, my majors in history. History. And I drug my f wife and family to all the Civil War and Revolutionary War area. This uh, area up here is fantastic. Have you ever toured it? Bits and pieces. It's on my bucket list. Well, when we get you back here next time for the taping, yeah. we'll have to do some but touring. We'll go on the I, road. I like to, my, I tell the kids that I teach, and I, I work with special needs kids, juvenile offenders, and I tell my kids, try to learn one new thing every day. Great philosophy. One, don't try to learn everything. 
just one, one thing. If you learn two or three, that's gravy. And you're a better person tomorrow than you were yesterday. So I like to, you know, and, and my wife goes nuts sometimes, but then she got hooked on the, the history. So now we'll go places and she'll say, well, you know, that's there and this is there. You're never too old to learn. Never. So. It's funny, I mentioned the circus that a gentleman we've had right there in that chair, a ring announcer, Gary Michael Capetta. Yeah. Huge fan of the circus. As a matter of fact, Gary actually pet one of our uh, associates over there, Cecil the Lion. I think he thought he was in the circus. Oh, yeah. wow. Gary's hand took on Did a mind of its own. Uh, he didn't get bit, but maybe something else happened. Oh, we'll, talk <laughs> we'll talk about that off the air. Uh, Royal Rumble 1989, you saw Haku defeat Harley Race. It was the end of Harley Race in WWE. I thought that was kind of sad, but Harley was in rough shape. Yeah, and I recently saw Harley. Ooh, yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the bumps and the miles and the chairs to the head and the drop kicks and the posts and, and life just takes a toll. That style really took its toll on the yeah. poor guy. Yeah, and Harley was wrestling all over the world in 60 minute, 90 minute matches. When he was NWA Nightly. champion, yeah. So you gotta give him credit. And Harley's a, I st he's still a tough guy, but he's not halfway as tough as he used to be. But uh, yeah, and, and I don't think that they, there again, I don't think that they knew actually what to do with Harley to make him the king and the, robe and the crown and the scepter and uh, you know let him do what he's good at yeah interviews and wrestling well you know he came then in they make haku then the king he right? became he, i think that was the, transition. was the king how many kings you got yeah, a lot of kings more than in england and lawler's the king well he's always been the king of memphis at least don't yeah. even go there yeah i don't think they were allowed to bring the, the purple crown when wwe ran memphis into the city. Jerry Lawley had so many lawsuits out. I think him and Harley had something going on, as a matter of fact. I Some didn't kind know of that. a lawsuit, yeah. He couldn't be the king in Memphis because of Jerry. Talk about vain, but. <laughs> Harley came into WWE, you know, he didn't look all that great. He was kind of broken down from his prime, but he still had a hell of a run with Hogan. And he had Junkyard a good name. Dog, See, his Duggan. reputation proceeded. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, it wasn't even a three-year run, but I, I bet he made some good money yeah. with that Hogan run, if nothing else. Yeah, and he earned it. I mean, he deserved it. He was, uh, he was a credit to the business. Sure. Another man right in that seat that you're in. Um, did you see any difference? You knew Holly for so long back in the NWA days when he was in his prime as the champion. Coming to WWF where he was just kind of, certainly wasn't one of the, the elite top guys, but... Well, you know, it was, a, it was a step down from where he was in the NWA, I think. Yeah, I, I knew Harley when he would come in and out of the territories that I was in. Mm -hmm. uh, being a heel, I never really got to work against him. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of times he would be on the matches with, say, Tommy Rich or Flair or Steamboat or something. And we'd be at another event someplace else. But I respected his drawing power. I respected his ability. Uh, I loved his promos. I still enjoy coming yeah. across them on YouTube. Yeah. You talk about credible and believable. Yeah, serious. That crap voice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and like you say, he came in in the latter part of his career. And uh, But there again, I just don't know if they knew what they had. Yeah. Uh, I agree with you. And they that. could have extended that, not in the ring, but they could have taken advantage of his expertise by having him as one of the trainers. Do because you think a lot of the trainers that they had never drew a dime. Right. I mean, look at some of the agents that they had back then. Yeah, a lot of them were undercard guys. Yeah. And telling you how to do interviews. Whoa. And telling you how really? to work. And telling you how to work. Sometimes, Ooh, let me ask you sometimes this. you had to bite your lip and it's, you're thinking in your mind. You don't say, I was, I'm never going to demean somebody by saying. You never did an interview in your life. Who you were, never was in a main event in your life. And you're telling me what to do. During that run, who were some of the guys that were helping produce the interviews? I don't think that there were anybody helping produce. 
there were people sitting behind the camera. Seeing Who were some of those guys? Seeing, well, uh, Gurria? Sergeant Goulet, Gurria. Rene Goulet, I, I don't remember him ever cutting a promo in his life. No. Nothing against him, but. <laughs> no, he wasn't in that, never, never put in that position. But there again, how are you going to, how am I going to tell you how to set up a disc and right. edit and this? I don't know. It's the problem I have a lot with a lot of these wrestling schools, Bill. You can teach someone how to do some moves, but if you've never been a full-time professional wrestler, how do you teach someone the professional wrestling business? I don't know. So that's a different story for a different I, I time. I'm I, sure both I, of us could go off on yeah, the tangent about that. I just don't that. know, uh, that, and that's pervasive in the business. Uh, they did it in WCW. They did it in a lot of places. They took guys that were underneath or opening card guys and they're training people well you can there's a difference between learning fundamental moves and learning how to make money big difference yeah anyone can teach you how to do some wrestling moves. yes yeah. the japanese are perfect examples of knowing all the fundamental moves they know every move on both sides of the curtain baby face heel but you got to put it together. Right. It's like a 500-piece jigsaw puzzle. Anyone can pick up a piece and a piece and a piece, but to put it together so you have the complete yeah. puzzle, that needs and detailed here, here's, training. Here's a major factor. Sometimes the people that are running the show want the inexperienced person during the training because when I tell him that's not the way it's done, Oh, yes, sir. Whatever you say. Well, if they have somebody that's seasoned and know what they're doing, say, what are you talking about? That's exactly how it's done. Oh, they want an underling. Like, they want I a yes see man. what you're saying. Yep, yep. And there's a lot of guys that, and I'm not faulting them, if you can make money being a trainer. Sure, take it. And, and, and nobody else has offered it to you, take it. But don't all of a sudden, six months down the road, think your shit don't stink. Because it does. <laughs> Good point. Headed into February 1989, it was one of the big events of the year on NBC. It wasn't Saturday night's main event. It was the main event, a special primetime slot. The 1988 version with Hogan and Andre had 33 million people in the United States watching it. 1989 wasn't as big of a success because it wasn't one of the legendary matches in the history of the genre, but it was Hulk Hogan and the Macho Man Randy Savage teaming up to defeat Big Boss Man and Akeem. It was the big days of our lives type storyline yeah. where Miss Elizabeth took, I think maybe the only bump in her wrestling career when Randy fell on top of her. Hogan scooped her up, took her to the back uh, for medical examination. They came back from the commercial break and Hogan wasn't ready and the said, kayfabe, give me the gimmick, <laughs> give me the countdown. I think they edited that out of the WWE Network version, but certainly one of the more memorable angles in wrestling history with the business well, that it did. Well, you know, it's funny. We were talking this afternoon, coming in from the airport, about that Vice Land. And yeah, I, And yeah. I watched that the Macho Man segment, one? segment on it. Uh, yeah, you're right. It was, uh, and that, that was a tremendous angle, too. Big money, man. Yeah. Was, uh, Do you think they turned Randy heel too soon? He was doing great business as the champion. Could they have continued to go Randy on one house show loop, Hogan on another with Randy still with the belt? Of course. Yeah. But there again, like in our situation, like in so many situations, sometimes what you have is good enough. Sure. You don't have to tweak it until it starts going down. Then you tweak it, it might bring it back up. And the, the lifespan might be another six months, another year. They don't do that. If we went that route that we're throwing out there, it would have been some interesting plans for WrestleMania V having to be changed up. But I'll say this, it, especially nowadays, when we get kind of frustrated with the pacing, overexposure and whatnot, no long-term planning, I have to say, they started that angle with Hogan and Randy in late 1987, and it wasn't until April of 89 that the payoff came with the, the turn and then the eventual match. So I got to say that creative was great. 
I just think as far as Randy is the champion outside of that storyline, I think they could have got a, so much more out of him as the top yeah. babyface champion. Yeah, I did Even too. if it was A and 1A with Hogan and Randy working different loops. Yeah. What are you going to do? A lot has been said about Randy over the years being very possessive of Elizabeth. Did you see that? Well, you know, there again, we were in the territory at that time was a lot different than it is now. You know, now they go and they're in Chicago. Everybody's there. Philly, everybody's there. Miami, everybody's there. Well, we had three or four different groups. So there and, were probably times you didn't see him for a couple months on the road. Well, we would see him. At TV. We'd see everybody monthly at TV. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you you can't wait to see the guys. But still, yet you can't wait not to see some of the guys. I but, feel that way at the studio. Yeah, I, you were telling me about that. So. <laughs> and after being around some of these you guys. You understand. So, yeah. You understand now, Bill. But uh, it's... They could have had three crews, four crews. There's enough talent. Sure. And I don't know why they narrowed it down to what... I don't even think they do house shows, small town shows anymore. Because I don't follow it. They but only I mean, have when you, two, when you two have, groups going at any time. They, they have two groups? Or they they have a Raw house show brand and a SmackDown house show brand each yeah, weekend. Yeah, but they used to have that out of one roster before. Oh, yeah. They used to have yeah. four sometimes four shows. They patterned after Mid-Atlantic in, in Georgia. We had three, three crews out of Georgia. Isn't that something? And that's why I keep saying in this day and age when people say I'm nuts, oh, you live, I wasn't even alive in the 70s, but oh, you live in 70s wrestling and so on and so forth. It's been done and it's worked. It just has to be it's still a, a believable, there. credible product. If you can get back to that core, there's potential for so many more millions of fans to enjoy wrestling again and to spend money on tickets and wrestling and to yeah. buy network subscriptions and yeah. merchandise as opposed to saying this sucks let me bitch about it on twitter or even worse they take the remote and shut it off and they never put it on again well you know one of my pet peeves and people will be watching this and they'll say oh this says some good things and some bad things and he doesn't know what the hell he's talking about they say that about me yeah but it's easy when you're all by yourself in the basement someplace and you're and you're being critical it takes a little bit more gumption to come face to face with somebody so when when people say things life's too short to worry about all that you're trying to do the best job you can do right i'm trying to do the best i can do i'll please some people like i used to tell we used to talk about wrestling i don't know how many hundreds of millions of people are in japan I mean, uh, China. Mm -hmm. Some like wrestling, some don't like wrestling, and some don't even know what the hell we're talking about. Right. That's the way life is. Like we were saying, I think in between shows, I said there's so many millions of wrestling fans out there right now that have no idea this show even exists, but there's a lot of them that might like it. It's just a matter of trying to find them. But yeah. yeah. I get your point. Yeah. But with Randy, though, was he tense around Elizabeth? I mean, locking her in closets? Well, there, I got off track and I apologize. That's okay. I, I, I wasn't aware of it. I heard of it. But you know what? If my wife, which wouldn't happen, was involved in this business around some guys. That's a very nice way to put it. Yeah. I, I knew you were looking for the word there for a second. I'd be protective, too. Would you lock her in a closet? No, no, I wouldn't right. do that. Now, she may lock me in a closet. <laughs> but I, maybe he just wanted to protect her from all the bullshit. And you know what? I can understand that point of view. I just think locking a human being in a closet, what have happened if there was an emergency in the building, a fire or something? Well, you know, I've heard that story a number of ways, mm -hmm. whether it actually happened or not. I don't know. And there again, I saw that vice land. And they, there were some suppositions there and some innuendos. But who knows? How was Miss Elizabeth as a person? There again, I saw her. She would say hello. She would Limited smile. Limited interaction. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that wasn't my... I was never going to wrestle her. <laughs> uh, you weren't going to do anything else with you know, her. She and, was a married and, woman. Yeah. 
I'm married. And She's married. It's just, I respected her, and uh, she was an asset to the company. And you know why? They presented her as nothing but classy. When WCW had her, they turned her trashy, and she had next to no value for them. Vince knew what he was doing with Miss Elizabeth. I mean, you look at her now, she's a pretty enough lady. But I remember being a kid watching the show. They presented her as the most An beautiful angel. woman in the world, the most perfect woman yeah. in the world. And they did it in a credible and believable way. That's why fans 20, 30 years from now will have some idea who Miss Elizabeth yeah. is, you know, as what, opposed to it, some of the ones they have now that and people want. And it's sad that, that she's not around. It's sad that Randy's not around to, to go and, and, and say hello and shake hands and sign autographs. And, uh, you know, we've, I'm sure you've talked about it. Sometimes the good ones just to go too soon. And the buttheads. That still would, with us. That you, yeah, that you would say, he ain't going to make it for five more years. They're still, they're still here, still doing the same goofy stuff. I don't know. No, nothing against uh, Buddy the Sheik, but I don't know how he's still alive. With what he was putting into his system until his late 60s yeah, before he cleaned up. He's fortunate. Uh, I haven't seen Sheik for a, a number of years. He's, I hate to say it, but he's kind of become a recluse. because we, he, I don't know if you knew this, but he was in the car accident with me when I got injured. And um, his ankle goes all the way down to where his foot is, so he really is immobile. But he actually made the first appearance he'd made in years coming to the WrestleCon this year, WrestleMania oh, weekend good. in New York. And what was funny was I met him and Tony Atlas the first night I ever worked in wrestling with Tony Rumble back in 93. And Tony was with us. He goes, let's go find Cheeky Baby. So we went down, we found him. And the three of us, it was like 1993 all over again. That was yeah. a, a fun to see him. I'd love to get him here one more time before... You know, his time may be completely unable yeah, to Yeah, how's his health otherwise? Reasonably good. good. I mean, I don't know what they fed them as babies over in Iran, but, I mean, what a life that guy has had, even before he ever got involved with the pro wrestling and then the drugs and so on. Yeah. He's been he, a, an interesting friend. He's been he, a good he, friend, he and he's driven the, me nuts. He, he had some years where he went off the, you're talking about deep end, he went off the canyon end. I'm sure you probably bumped into him at the airport a few times causing scenes. He was yeah. known for that. I mean, yeah. traveling with him was tough. Yeah. I remember, not that this has anything to do with 1989, I got him booked on uh, like a reality TV show up in Canada, and they flew me up with him knowing his uh, reputation online. It was Thanksgiving week, and we were in the cab going to meet friends of his at some Iranian restaurant. And I, I couldn't understand what he was saying. I don't speak Farsi, but... Uh, he got in the front with the cab driver. He said, going, Hedabin! 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 Hashish! Oh, and I'm like, oh, my God, we're not going to get back in time for Thanksgiving. And this cab driver, if you could have heard this weak little voice he was replying in, he goes, oh, no, I, I don't have anything to do with that. He goes, please, WWE champion. I had a chick. I need my medicine. I the Z. <laughs> and I'm like, you've got to be shitting me. I'm in the back. I don't know why I'm in the back seat alone and why he's in the front seat. I don't, the, the cabbie, he just, I don't think he was a wrestling fan. He was probably worried the Sheik was going to pull a gun on him oh, or something. wow. It, it was an interesting experience up in Toronto, but they're all memorable with him. They You're are. You're lucky to be far enough away in Georgia from him when he was at his peak of crazy. Yeah. He's Paul about, Orndorff wasn't so lucky. He's he was, about an hour and a half from me. He lives on the south side of Atlanta, and I live on the north side. Well, someday we'll have to, I want to do a big chic retrospective with all the people that know him because in his heart, he's a good human being. Yeah. He just got messed up yeah. with the wrong stuff. I first met the chic. Was he sober? In Japan. Yeah. When he, he was just coming in from uh, AWA mm -hmm. and he was straight as narrow. His wife told me in AWA, he was as clean as a whistle. It was when he went down south. I don't know if it was for Watts, but somewhere down south. And he got hooked up with Orton in the gang. And oh, <laughs> that was it for Sheiky Baby's sobriety. <laughs> All right. Again, great feud, Hogan and Randy, Miss Elizabeth. Sad that both of them are gone right now. Um, what about an entry into WWE in February of 89? Tony Schiavone joined the commentary team. What are, you, what are your thoughts on Tony coming in? Uh, veteran of NWA, WCW. Yeah, I, I knew Tony briefly when we were in uh, Georgia territory, and then I was going back and forth to Japan. Tony, he's working with the Braves now. 
Yeah. Uh, he's done. He's done real good with his career. Good. He. Uh, this podcast is extremely popular. Is it? I don't. Yeah. I'm, it, it's I'm on par really, with like you know the Bruce Pritchards and whatnot. Yeah, I'm not really into podcasts and stuff. Uh, I don't have much time, you know, free time. So. Still working. Yeah. Plus, you get your shows. You got yeah. a family. You got grandkids. Yeah. Well, I got things. To do. You got to figure out how to use yourself. I got the honeydew phone. list when I come home, and uh, <laughs> so I don't have. That'll much. be waiting for I you can, on Sunday I can, night. I, can, I well, she'll give me a break till Monday. All right, that's good. But when I come that's home, good. I got to do lesson plans and stuff. Oh yeah, like you get your schoolwork to do. Yeah. So, um, Tony, to me, I thought he was a step down from Gorilla and Vince. Those were what my ears had grew up with for the first few yeah. years of watching WWF, and I don't know if he ever necessarily clicked. He was wasn't there for a heck of a long time. He had, a, now, he had about a he, year to run. He went back to about a year WCW. later. Yeah, he yeah. went back to WCW. Yeah. So I know he has said that they had to send him for dictation lessons to try and speak a more unsouthern way and that doing might the commentary. Be. And that I guess Vince be. was pretty anal about that. Oh, um, and the funny thing is Linda McMahon hired him and she kind of has a southern drawl. She's a North Carolina lady. Yeah. Any memories of Tony? Did you have any preference of the commentators at the time? Gorilla, Vince, Jesse? Uh, not really. No? Uh, you don't think anyone got you I over just, better than I others? Was, we really never listened to them. You weren't home to see it. We weren't home to see it. <laughs> uh, we didn't watch our matches on TV. Uh, we were involved in wrestling, going to the gym, getting on the plane, making the next town. So I'm sure they all tried to do their best. I, I, the one I did like, and I listened to him when we were up in Montreal, was um, the English guy, uh, Lord? No, oh my God, I haven't. You have a brain freeze, Bill. Senior Lord. Uh, Come on, fans at home, play along with us. Who is Bill Eady trying to remember here, up in Canada? An English guy. Alfred Hayes. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay, you liked Lord Alfred Hayes? Yeah. Really? I Why liked, was that? I liked the tone and the yeah the the infliction and the. Yeah, he, I, and I did listen to him because we were doing events and we had free time in Montreal, not as hectic. Oh, as I see, when they'd tape the house show matches. Right. I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah he usually would be. And he would do the, the interviews, time. too. He would do a lot of interviews. So I, I did like that. Uh, Gorilla wasn't doing interviews. Vince wasn't doing interviews. So you really never heard you know, what they had to say. The one I, the one I would praise would be Gene Oakland. And Alfred. Oh, oh, you know what? Gene Oakland, unfortunately, I would have loved to have had him in that seat. Uh, but he passed away a few months ago. What a credit to the business. Oh. Even, again, someone that has been gone full time from WWE for over 25 years is still remembered so fondly. And nowadays you have the, it has to be a female doing these interviews backstage. They're presented like robots. You are one of the greatest sports entertainers in WWE. What do you think? It, people don't remember them the next week. And they answer. And they answer, like, and yeah. The answer is and just robotic. as robotic. <laughs> All right, wrestling fans, I'm hearing the music in the background. We're going to take a brief time out. We'll be back with more memories and legends as we look at WWF, not that other name, in 1989. Stand by. Portland. On Saturday, August 31st, feel the thrill of WWE Live. The age of Rollins is here. And we are going to burn it down. See Seth Rollins collide with Baron Corbin for the Universal Championship. Plus, Becky Lynch takes on Lacey Evans for the Raw Women's Championship. And don't miss AJ Styles and Braun Strowman. It's WWE Live on Saturday, August 31st. Tickets and WWE Superstar Experience packages are available. Wrestling fans, welcome back to Memories and Legends. It's the June edition. I'm here with the one, the only, a man I have so much respect for, a great human being on top of being a legendary talent, Mr. Bill Eady, Demolition X, mass superstar. On our break, we ate well, Bill. We did. We have to thank our good we need, friends. We need more breaks. Right down the street at Gabriella's here in Melrose, we're going to do the video insert of this fine institution. They're new to our great city. Uh, and it's nice that they're only a couple of blocks away. That's very good. Cecil the Lion's good friend Rosie, she does a great job running the plate. Our friend Mateus 
is always great for the deliveries. They're good folks. We implore you to get out and visit. Maybe if you're feeling generous at the end, maybe we can give them a picture, an 8 by 10 for the wall. Certainly. You'd be the first one on their wall. Certainly. And I think uh, it would be very fitting for it to be you. All right, let's get back to where we were talking about 1989 WWF, now that we're a little bit more full. Uh, J.J. Dillon comes to WWF, fresh from the NWA only. J.J. isn't on camera managing anyone. He's managing talent in the back and kind of what the future uh, talent relations position he would made be. made a complete circle, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had met J.J. years before that in Canada. And then, of course, in this business, you lose track of people. Oh, sure. Didn't, didn't see him again until years later at that time. So very successful career. Uh, I consider him a good friend. Uh, credit to the business. Uh, very knowledgeable. What kind of a role would the 1989 Talents Relations be? What would Jay, I know he helped a little bit with the booking, but what kind of in, interactions would he have with the talent at that point? Well, would he help with bookings? Would he help with transportation, he, personnel issues? I'm not sure what, what his specific job was. I, I'm sure that was a little bit above an agent. Maybe he oversees the agency. Mm -hmm. um, and probably, if they were smart, and I'm sure they were, utilize his skills and booking skills and uh, angles and stuff like that. Were you surprised that he didn't manage anyone when he came in? No. No. I, I just didn't, uh, I didn't see him in that position. Uh, and then later on, of course, he did it and was successful there too. Well, he had a vast knowledge of when a certain key NWA contracts would expire as there were a parade of NWA stars that would come in over the next year or two, fresh right. from Atlanta. So he well, you know, at that time they had a lot of managers too. Yeah, uh, Bobby and uh, Fuji and Slick, and they maybe had too many managers. So when some of those weeded out, he probably moved in that position. Oh no, J.J. Dillon didn't manage anyone in WWE. Okay, I was thinking, I didn't remember, didn't recall he did. <laughs> well, that's what I, I was kind of surprised that he never did. Where that was kind of his, his claim yeah. to fame. And then he came to WWF and he was just strictly office. Right. Yeah. He was a good guy yeah, to deal with? Oh, yeah. I never had a problem with that. I, I, we see him periodically at uh, fan fest and conventions and things like that. And he's always the same. He's low key, uh, serious about the business. Seems to have uh, knowledge of what's going on, but not to the point where I don't think he wants to get back into it. You know, likes what he's doing now. So. Everyone says he's got a heck of a book. I haven't re read it yet. I, I haven't read one any of those self-published. So I, have, I oh, think, you haven't read any books. I think I haven't read any books either. About wrestling? I haven't read any of the books about from the boys or about the business and stuff. And when I sit back and have some time, I'll collect them all. Maybe they'll be cheaper at that time. Look at the vast collection we have here, Bill. If you see anything you like, let us yeah, know. 50% yeah. off for you. Okay. <laughs> now you talk about some of the, imagine if things like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter were around back in the 80s with the boys. That would be some interesting material. Oh boy. Um, Haku ran into some trouble. Uh, late in 88, he was in a bar fight and he bit off someone's nose. Mm -hmm. And then February 15th after a now, TV. let me put this all to right, you. Let's hear it. You're sitting in a bar. <laughs> you look over in the corner and you see a guy and he's Haku. You're going to pick on that guy unless you've had too many drinks. Right. You've had the liquid courage. courage. Liquid courage. I think I'd, I'd, one, I wouldn't approach him in the first place. Two, if I really was intent on fighting, I'd pick somebody different. Or... Three, I'd be smart and leave. Leave. So. I tell you, and then he had another situation, as I was mentioning, after the TV taping in New York, where he beat up two guys for talking to a, a woman. I don't know if he was trying to have uh, relations with the woman or what the situation may have been. But well, I, I think I heard that they were disrespectful. To him? To her. Oh, to her. Okay. He didn't know her, but he was trying to stick up for I got you. her being a lady. And, uh, yeah, I heard that, too. 
Was there again. I, was Haku a, a, kind of a wild child? Or I, I no. heard he's someone that I don't really know him. Someone that you'd be a great friend, but someone you wouldn't want to make an enemy with. He is a great friend. Uh, and he's not someone you'd want to make an enemy with. No. If you, would, if you value your nose. No, but he's such a nice guy. I'm sure that some people try to take advantage. They, they, they mistake kindness for weakness. And they probably figure, well, he's so sweet. What's he going to do? Meanwhile, you're trying to grab your, your larynx back and put it in your throat. Right. So. Biting off someone's nose, that must have been quite the... Uh, I don't think it was the meal we had from Gabriella's. No. No. Um, and what I didn't realize, it, it, obviously it would be basic math, but he's not that old of a guy now, but he was, wasn't even 30 years old at that point. I don't, I don't recall, but yeah, you're I was surprised right. by that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't know how old I would have expected him to be then, but yeah, yeah. he looked a lot older than he was. Yeah, unlike someone like Andre that looked like he was about sixty, and Holly Race and some of those that didn't age as well. But yeah. certainly one of the tough guys. Did you see a problem where the guys were on the road so much, where it would lead to a lot of the fights? I'm sure there were many more than are out there nowadays in wrestling lore than these two with Haku. Well, you know, uh, both Barry and I. When we were on the road, I looked at it like it was a job. I was supposed to go to the matches in the gym. I was supposed to take care of myself by sleeping good, good hotels, driving comfortable cars, and eating good and working out. Uh, once the matches were done, we would look for a restaurant. We'd get something to eat. We'd go to the room and get some rest. Get up, because you got to do it every day. Right. Now, some of the guys would leave the arena and then go to the bar all night and stumble onto the plane. That wasn't, I mean, I, I looked at it, it's a job. I'm not going to do this forever. Right. I might as well take care of myself. So consequently, we didn't get into the, the, the drug scene or the drinking scene or the party scene. You were a very boring interview. <laughs> yeah, and it's, uh, I, I know that it took place because it did It was take around place. you constantly, right. But I wanted to go home with money that I was earning. Not wasting it. Not going home and my wife say, well, we've got to pay this, but oh, I don't have it, honey. Uh, make up a story where I lost it. How many times can you lose it? Right. Because you drank it or smoked it or. Snuffed, sn right, snorted. snorted it, yeah. Um, and consequently, I mean, we never had a problem. I think the guys respected the fact that if I don't want to go drinking, I'm not going drinking. I think that's the way it should be. Yeah. Do what you want, but don't yeah. know, peer pressure. But there were some it. guys that they were paranoid for one reason or another, for one drug or another that they thought, well, maybe you're not doing something and you're going to snitch on me. That wasn't my gimmick. I didn't, I didn't give a damn what they did, <laughs> so long as it doesn't bother me. And Barry was the same way. And, uh, but those guys aren't around anymore. Think of how many people from this era we're talking Horrible. about are no longer with us. Horrible. And it's consequences for their actions. Choices, bad choices. Yeah. Um, promotional sabotage. I think maybe it hit its peak in 89. Started with, go back to the first Survivor Series, trying to run head-to-head -head on pay-per-view with Starcade 87 that year. Fast forward to 1989, uh, you have, as a result of some of WWE's maneuvers, the NWA Ted Turner, where they had a real power broker behind them now, as opposed to Jim Crockett. Ted Turner was a man with great influence in yeah. all of entertainment and television. And Try and the money, the money, more than WWE's Vince McMahon at that point. Yeah. Um, they had attempted to run Wrestle War 89 head to head on pay per view with WrestleMania 5. It ultimately turned into a free Clash of the Champions special. But uh, how did you guys look at that? In a way, you were killing each other. Well, not you specifically, but the two companies yeah. were only hurting each other. Well, the, the companies, the boys. It only affected you if one of the companies went out of business. Right. And we were happy that the boys in the other company were working and vice versa. And it, it, it sort of leads up to present day, 
situation. Yeah. With the AEW. Yeah. You've got an individual who has a tremendous amount of money, more money than Vince. Oh, sure. And I hope they don't go down that same route because at that time with Turner, they had too many guys in Turner's pocket. And they weren't going to pet him. They were trying to get that wallet out. They could have existed for a lot longer. Sure. Uh, they squandered a lot of money on ridiculous contracts. Uh, and I hope that doesn't transpire now because they've got a situation where it could, here we go, it goes right around in a circle. Hopefully we don't see a repeat of what WCW's existence well, was. That I would hope be very, not. very I sad when there is potential see, and for there something again, great to come out of it. Yeah, there again, it's good for the boys. Right, yeah, more places Two to companies. work. yeah. Oh, an attempt to actually negotiate a, town, a contract instead yeah. of being just given one to sign? Exactly. Yeah, I think it's a great thing overall. But as far as, okay, it's good for the boys that these opportunities exist, but with, in your instance, WCW, an attempt to run a pay-per-view the day of WrestleMania or a Clash of the Champions, that's going to take away from the buys of WrestleMania Five. And WrestleMania Five was very successful at that point. That was the most bought pay-per-view in company yeah. history. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, and I wasn't aware that that took place. In that you didn't we even were, know that? No, because... It's a good thing you have me around then. Yeah, right? you got, you're the fact man. <laughs> uh, that's, that's interesting because... There again, it didn't affect us because we're in the forest right. with all the yep. trees. And at the, on the flip side, you have WCW. They put together a, a hell of an event. It was the Ricky Steamboat, Ric Flair, two out of three falls matches. And they're running it on a wrestling holiday, so to speak, with, uh, you know, I'm sure there were more than one person in each of those 600,000 plus homes watching the event. Yeah. All those eyeballs, if it was a different weekend or a different day, there was the potential for them to tune into Clash of the Champions. Yeah. I think if someone paid the now, money... They have, I wonder if they had DVR at that time. In 1989, no. We were lucky, See, to, we were lucky to have cable here in Melrose. Yeah, we that didn't, would, wouldn't it, that be interesting? We didn't get pay-per-view access until... The first one was Great American Bash 88. We weren't able to get pay-per-view before that. So when I was a real young guy, my father's friend at work would, did have cable in the city he lived in, and he'd tape them for me. So I'd come home from school on the Monday. I'd be waiting for my father to come home to watch the pay-per-view from the night before on yeah. the VCR. Yeah. So those, those were my early... I remember WrestleMania 4. It was reported in the newspaper. I found out the morning after WrestleMania that you guys won the titles from Strike Force, and I was all excited. But I had to wait until later that night to be able to, to see it. it. And yeah. I tell you, that event sucked. Yeah. It was, I think you guys went on right before last, too. It was a long wait. Yeah. It was a long wait. Yep. Sitting through Dino Bravo a couple of times, you know. <laughs> Anyways, continuing on down our list. Th this one is really interesting when you look at the history of the business. Uh, you know, you talk about, oh, the Randy Savage Hogan angle. And WCW and WWF are fighting behind the scenes to see who's going to run what event what day. WWF had come out that winter and admitted in New Jersey and in Washington that professional wrestling was predetermined, I guess is the best way to put it. Did you guys have any idea that this was even going on? Or now, in hindsight, how do you look back at that? Well, we heard about it, of course. You know, and you're, you're, you're involved in it. And my upbringing was protection of the business. Sure. And it wasn't based on tax revenue. That's all it was based on. Mm -hmm. uh, they were paying, I think, a quarter, 15 to 20, 25 cents per seat tax. Wow. And that adds up. To, yeah, but to protect the integrity of the business, and in the long run, it's not going to affect it that much. Uh, to do that, a lot of the guys lost a lot of respect for the company. Really? Yeah. Do you think it was a mistake? Well, I don't think that they had... It, I, I wasn't involved in the bookkeeping, but my decision wouldn't have been to do it. It may have come out later in a different way. At some point, yeah. yeah. Someone was going to squeal publicly in a but, big way someplace, but somewhere. Here's the situation, and I think if you, if you remember, there was a lot of money invested in those pay-per-views, and in particular, sure. WrestleManias. Mm -hmm. And, and where was WrestleMania in 1989? And they weren't really sure that they were going to recoup the money, so 
just that extra 25 cents per seat might be a make or break. Yeah. But it's kind of a, I mean, you don't have much faith in your company if you're doing that. Well, you're talking about, just say it was 20,000 people, you're talking about five grand extra. That's peanuts. Yeah. Did it have That's any, a catering bill. Did it have anything to do with the, I don't know if because it was licensed as a sport, if they had to pay anything out of the pay-per-view revenue? Maybe I don't think so, but I know? mean, they were running so many events in New York and New Jersey at the time. It, it probably, say you did 20 events, you're looking at $100,000. Yeah. But when you're making millions, uh, you, you can't keep it anyway. There's no handles on the bills. You can't keep it anyway. So you got to be wise with it. Make some charitable donations to this. Offset. And there's ways around it. Yeah. Offset yeah. it. Yeah. Were the boys embarrassed? I don't know if they were embarrassed. I think they were pissed off. I remember my feeling was, why, why are you doing this? This is how I make a living. You know, when it stems down to 25 cent per seat. Yeah. I'm, I'm that really was the only benefit? That's the one we saw. Really? We weren't privy to all the information, but I think when it comes down to it, every, everything, Dan, revolves around Absolutely, but I would think at that point in 1989... It certainly couldn't be insurance. We had none. They have none. No. It you, couldn't be... You weren't going to get that. It couldn't be OSHA regulations. There were none. None. What could it be? <laughs> And just think, the, for each one of those 25 cent taxes. Hell, they, the boys could have taken a donation and done that. Well, that's what I mean. I mean, think about that. If they made an extra $5,000 a show, what would that be for you guys? An extra 500 and 25 cents. To sp split around you guys? 25 cents a piece. You think 20? <laughs> I think it'd be a little more than that, but not too much more. Well, they'd find an expense for it, I'm sure. They'd have some way to, to explain yeah, yeah. it to you guys that they couldn't give it to yeah, you. Yeah. Um, all right, interesting story, interesting time. There was a story going around at that point. I heard of one of these two, but I heard Ted Turner wanted to aggressively make an offer to bring Hogan in in 1989. Now, it didn't happen, obviously. He, he wound up going in 1994. But in 1989, when WWF was still hot and on a roll from the, the mid-'80s boom from MTV and the rock and wrestling, what would it have meant to WWF to lose Hogan in an 89? Oh, that's period? a franchise. Yeah. He's the franchise. And Hogan, I'm sure, had loyalty to Vince mm -hmm. uh, and had, a, I guess, an understanding, whether it was a written contract or a verbal contract. But, you know, you got to give credit to Hogan for sticking with Vince. But if he'd have taken him, it, it would have precipitated the move a lot quicker. Instead of when did he go? 94. It would have been in, in 89, 90. But, it would have been shifted completely. Those could have been some very interesting years for WCW in 89 if they were able to land Hogan then. Because, yeah. I mean, they weren't yeah. much of a threat to WWF at that point. They were still producing really good yeah. quality events, and they yeah. had a great roster. Yeah. It would have been interesting to see Hogan and Flair in 89. That would have been interesting. Yeah. Both, also, both of them a lot younger. Yeah. Uh, that was a big disappointment, that feud, once it actually happened. Well... You can anticipate, but sometimes the, the, the build-up doesn't... The build-up is so extreme that even if they were fantastic matches, they wouldn't live up to it. Like, if, if you want to throw an analogy out there, like with you guys, when you never even wound up having a, a Axe and Smash Legion of Doom feud. Yeah. The the chemistry the six bands were, weren't that great. We see, had that through Boston. It was Boston. horrible. Yeah. The chemistry. But there again, you have to have a situation where you're working for the best match, not trying to get a team over. Right. And that was our situation. Yeah. Uh, and I think Joe will tell you, when, when they came into New York, we were the team. If we'd have gone to W it would have been they would have would been, have been a team. reversal, right. So right. But there has to be a mutual working relationship towards the best match. Not, I'm trying to do, be better than you. I'm going to be better than you. And they, they stink. Yeah. And, you know, we were friends, and Joe and I and Barry are still friends. And unfortunately, Mike's not around. But we were all friends in the business. 
Uh, it just didn't click. It didn't click. It didn't click. No. They were punch and kick, and you guys went out there and were working brawlers. Yeah. I guess would be a good analogy. Yeah. Different styles. Well, a Hogan jump would have been interesting, going fresh from WWF to WCW. At the same time, uh, a gentleman that was off the canvas for a couple of years, Rowdy Roddy Piper, was trying to play NWA against WWF to get the best deal possible. Yeah. How would it have turned out, you think, in 89? If a hot rod who we hadn't seen in two years went down to NWA, who was he was hot in that territory from the early '80s. Yeah, he was there when I was there as mass superstar. Okay. Uh, you know, Piper was a tremendous talent. Uh, had a following, like you say, history would have completely been changed. Do you we, think we might not be talking about WWE? E or WWF. Could now. Piper have been a Hogan to WCW at that point? It's hard to say because Hogan was, Hogan's, they're both unique. Uh, Hogan was the franchise. Piper was one of the, and we keep talking about it, superstars. Uh, it would have hurt. It would, I mean, it would have propelled them to a different level. Uh, and I didn't know that was. See, when you're there, you don't know. You don't all know this all stuff. this stuff is going no. on, right? So almost, you talk about the history lessons as you're a, a fan of U.S. Yeah. history, but yeah. in some ways, this is almost like a wrestling history lesson for things. It is, yeah. You lived it, but you were so busy, you didn't even know yeah, some of these things were going the thing. on. We were so busy doing what we did. Yeah. That there's not much time. I mean, I don't understand. How the hell are you going to worry about Roddy Piper being a free agent when you're on the road 300 days a year? You, you, it's an interesting you story, the, but you're living. You catch the first flight, yep. usually at 6 o'clock. You fly to the town. You find a gym. You work out. You get to the hotel. You check in. You get ready for the building. You go to the building, and you had to be at the building early because a lot of places had uh, commissions, so mm -hmm. you had to get a physical. Sure. You're there, even if we were on last, we're there early. It's 7 o'clock. Okay, uh, doors open at 8. Uh, you're there till last 11 o'clock, you're getting out of the building. You're a top you go to guy, get yeah, yeah. Go to get something to eat, go back to the hotel. You gotta get some sleep, because you gotta get up at five o'clock to do it again. That's why I couldn't understand. And all the, these guys doing all this stuff. Yeah. How could I didn't you, have time how could to you think survive? about. Yeah. I didn't have time to think about Piper moving. Or yeah. Hogan jumping, but, right? You yeah. worried about you, you worried about have, Bill. They would have approached us then we'd have been involved in that situation. Right. Did you ever have feelers from WCW in I that had, era? I uh, had Ole Anderson, who was the booker at the time, and Vader was in there at the time. Leon? Okay. Yeah. And Ole had approached me, and we were doing so well with, with demolition at the time. Ole wanted me to come back as mass superstar and work a program with Vader. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's an interesting pair. Yeah. So would you, would you have been the heel or the baby face? I don't know. Oh, okay. It never got to the point. I don't know. I, I never knew him at that time. I got you. I probably would have been a babyface because I left as a babyface. But I, I turned him down. And then later on, when we were contemplating, you know, when they brought LOD in and they were sort of trying to shit can us, uh, I had approached him again through not begging for a job, just putting feelers out. And they were sort of interested, but then I went to Japan. I went back to Japan as a mass superstar. So. Well, Roddy Piper, you knew him a younger version than we first saw in the mid 80s in WWF. What was a young hot rod like in mid Atlantic? Well, I first met uh, Piper in Japan years ago. Oh, when did he was you? Really okay. green and mm -hmm. young. And he was a character then. He had lots of fire. Uh, he was all over the place. He was like a. Uh, Roddy Piper uh, on speed, you know, all over the place. But always a good guy. I always got along with him. Uh, he knew my wife. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, they got along. Uh, he was a jokester. He was uh, one of those guys that, of all the guys that you hear dying, there's a few of them that you sit back and say, well, wow, that hurts. And he was one of those guys. Really? He was, uh, uh, he went through a lot in his business. 
in his life, in not his just life. the business. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it's sad. You know, he's, he loved his family. He put everything he had to in this business, and I don't know if he was appreciated by the office. The fans loved him. And then, you know, the one thing that irks me, and it's nothing against her, but why does Rousey have to have that outfit? She has said that she very, very close with Piper in real life, okay. and that's his. That's See, his I don't action. know her. That's his leather coat that she wears. Okay, I don't know her, and I, 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 I didn't know that. But when I first saw it, I'm thinking you found it distasteful. I, I, yeah, I found it a little disrespectful. If, if it wasn't approved by Roddy, I think it's extremely disrespectful. But the way it's been presented, as I know it, is that it was they were very good friends. If and it's he, truthful, that's he fine. let her. He wanted her to be called Rowdy Ronda Rousey. Okay. So if that's the case, I think it's a nice tribute. If it wasn't done with his approval, I think it's insulting. There you go. They have done some insulting things, you know. What day of the week? Yeah. <laughs> and they've denied some things, too. Oh, well, you, we could do a, probably a, an, an encyclopedia of episodes on that. Yeah. But I tell you, the funniest story I can recall from Piper from the mid-Atlantic time came in this studio in that very chair from your friend Cheeky Baby. <laughs> Sheik, uh, Was it a, a tour up in Ohio or Michigan? I think they were in the Carolinas at this oh. point, coming back from some show speeding, and they got pulled over, and Sheik, bless this officer to no end during the interview. He said, God bless this officer. He pulled us over. We had the grinder. We had the cocaine. I gave him $500. He let us go. God bless you, officer. Ya Allah, ya Muhammad, ya Jesus. <laughs> I can believe he'd say that. But I, I, I find it hard to believe that the guy took it, but you never know. You don't think the cop took it in the mid-80s? Early 80s? Yeah. Couldn't you guys get out of tickets pretty easy down? Well, not you. They wouldn't know who you were. but They wouldn't know who. Now, it's funny because when we used to come back from Raleigh TV to Charlotte, we had to go through this town called Asheboro. Mm -hmm. It was about a 10-mile area where this particular police officer monitored all the time. And he came to the, and he rushed, he, he got everybody for speed, everybody. So he came to the Raleigh TV taping one time, and he comes up to me, and he says, uh, do you know who I am? I said, yeah, I think I do, sir. Do you have the hood on? Yeah, I had the mask okay. on. He said, uh, I've caught just about everybody speeding through <laughs> Iceberg, except I don't think I've caught you. He says, uh, and I had a green van at the time, Dodge van. He said, uh, what kind of car do you drive? <laughs> I said, a blue Cadillac. He said, I'll keep an eye out for you. He never caught me. <laughs> Did he really think you were going to be driving down the highway with the mask on? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. To me, that's a more interesting to, story. I used to have to, to protect the, the gimmick, I used to have to, when I got into the car, I always had the mask on. And I'd put a towel over my head and I'd put the towel in my teeth and hold it. Really? Yeah. And sometimes... Well, the fans had easy access to you. Well, Don. they'd drive up beside you. Yeah, they'd drive yeah, up yeah, yeah. and they'd try to take pictures. Sometimes I'd have to go literally 100 miles. Before you could take it before off? Before I could take it off. Really? And then what I would do, just to be safe, I'd take the mask off and I'd keep the towel up. And I'd put the... Towards the window, I'd put it in my lip. Really? I had, I had fans follow me home. Oh. From Raleigh to Charlotte. Now, how do you deal it's with 150 that? 150 miles. So here I'm, you know, it's before cell phones, so I'm driving around going Trying into some different yeah. subdivisions and stuff until they, they finally give up. They, I hope they realize that I'm not going in a house. You ditched them before you got to your house? Of course. Oh, good, good. Yeah. Crazy times, but yeah. wasn't it kind of easy for the guys to get out of a ticket back then? A lot of the, the offices were big fans. I think... It probably was. I don't know. I never got any traffic tickets, thank God. Uh, I think it was easy for everybody except Gene Anderson, because <laughs> Gene would cut a uh, a double X-rated promo on him. In the car? In the car. Oh, okay. So he didn't have the appreciation for him for the Sheik. No, no. Well, the Sheik liked people that let him drive off with his grinder and his. Yeah, yeah. What are you gonna do? 
It's a typical Saturday night down in Charlotte, right? That's right. <laughs> oh, boy, that's why I love these shows. All right, March 8th. I don't know if you are familiar with this gentleman. We'll see. A professional wrestling lost one of the great promoters of its time, Paul Bosch from down in Houston. Were you ever down in Houston? I, I was in Houston, but uh, I don't think Bosch was the promoter at the time. Uh, and predated I had, him? I went in, oh, I heard of him. Yeah. And uh, he had a good reputation. I heard took, he was one of the best payoff men in the business. Took care of the talent. Everybody wanted to be in there. Uh, it really, it wasn't a full-time territory. No. Though. It, it, was, it was pretty much just Houston, right? It was in conjunction with uh, Bill Watts in Louisiana. Oh, okay. It was, and, it was Friday night, was that Houston? Friday night was the big event, I, I think? I was in there a couple times. Uh, Worked against, uh, two times I worked against uh, Bill Mascaris. Oh, really? Horrible matches. Everyone said he was awful. Horrible Is that true? Matches. I don't know if he was awful with everybody, but he was awful with me. And kind I don't of know a crowbar? If was... No, 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 no. Not a crowbar. He would just, just wouldn't sell nothing. He was, uh, he was Bill Mascaris, superstar. Why should he sell for me? I was just nobody mass man. He tried to, he caused an issue with the Cauliflower Alley Club because he wanted to go through the casino with the mask on. I mean. Well, let him go. <laughs> That's up to the security. <laughs> but you know what? It's, uh, here and again. what other business would you say, oh, you know what? He needs to keep his mask on to go through the casino. And, and he's a handsome ridiculous. guy. It's not like he Oh, you've seen a, him without the mask? Yeah, yeah, I've seen him in Japan. Did he used to shower with it on? He had it on all the time, oh. but so did I in Japan. That did was. You? That was prerequisite in Japan. You had to I had to go on. on the trains and on the planes and on the ships and you had to wear it all the time. Really? That was part of the gimmick. But if they're paying you and they ask you to hey, do you it. Know, you don't say no. Yeah. But uh, it was like wrestling too. Wrestling too in Georgia. Uh, wore the mask everywhere. He wouldn't. Did he? He wore the mask into 7-Elevens, which <laughs> you can't do that today. No, you imagine if you walked in in this day and age to a 7-Eleven with a mask on. We're losing one of our great helps, Mr. Nick over there. Thanks, Nick, for all the great help in the studio. We're, we're, we're going to miss him. Well, he was invited. I don't know if you know this story. No, let's see this one. Day. Oh, the White House, right? He was invited to the White House inauguration for Jimmy Carter. He was going to wear the mask there. <laughs> I'm thinking, you're carrying us a little too far. I, I enjoyed my gimmick and I protected it, but if I got to get to go to the president, maybe I can take the mask off. Where is the most unusual place you wore the mask superstar mask over the years? Can you think of one odd place that you say, what the hell am I doing? This isn't well, what it, most people do. Well, it was kind of strange in Japan, but... When you, when you saw how the fans reacted. Uh, the one tough thing was I had, I never had the eating masks, which the, the mask is cut out right here so he could eat. So we're going to all these restaurants and banquets and, and everybody else is eating and I can't eat because I'm getting stuff all over my mask. So they had a couple guy, mask makers over there make me some. Banquet masks, so you can Banquet go out mask, on yeah. the town mask, superstar mask? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. But, I mean, funny. over there, they recognized who I was. I mean, it was a big thing. Even without the hood? No, no, oh, with, okay. with the mask. They wouldn't know me without the mask. Yeah, that's So I could sneak out without the mask, and I was just a, a large American that was on vacation. Yeah. They wouldn't have known any different. Yeah. In WWF, did you ever have to travel anywhere in a rush with the makeup on? Oh, yeah. We've gone from... <laughs> We've gone from, you know, it's funny because you're going down to, say you're in Boston and you're going from one place to another and people are driving and you stop at the stop <laughs> sign, stop light and they look, and they got, the, pretty soon they got the cameras yeah. on, hey, that's, you know, but you got to do it. You got to do hey, you got to make the time, right? Yeah. And that, yeah. it's not easy to put that makeup on and off. No. It takes its time too. All right, because we continue down the trip down memory lane, WWF 1989. Another undercard guy is kind of redeveloped, as we saw with Brooklyn Brawler earlier in 89. Lanny Poffo becomes the genius. Did mm -hmm. you think that was a genius way to portray Lanny? No pun intended. He went from throwing Frisbees into the crowd to throwing insults at the crowd. Yeah. Uh, Lanny's a bright guy. I yeah. mean, I think, that, I think that particular gimmick suited him because he was, uh, you know, he could 
get these limericks right off the top of his head. And if he had time to develop one, it was they were really good. And I, like we were talking, I we did a a signing a couple of weeks ago in Pittsburgh, and he's rattling them again. Was he? So, uh, you know, and when you mentioned him throwing frisbees. I vaguely remember that character, so it wasn't impressive. Leaping the genius, the genius was much more appropriate for him. Do you think they could have created a character for him that maybe revolved around his specialty outside of the ring, the art of fellatio? Oh, and he'd roll himself in almost a, a beach ball. That'll be another episode. Did anyone ever attempt to roll him like a ball? Because he was having a ball, maybe with his ball. I don't recall. <laughs> Did you ever witness this? The act, or you just heard about no, it? No, even if I had an opportunity, I would. <laughs> you would have left the room if there was a little self-serving. I wouldn't have going been on. in the room. <laughs> I don't know There's why. There's certain things I don't do. Well, you know what? You're not the only one. I think Lanny's one of the very few I've ever known of that has the skill to please himself in that manner. You well, know, you, he, if he was a man that said, had no hands, he still would have been pleased. You said that I did. <laughs> I don't know how that comes up, but every time Lanny Poffo comes up in one of these interviews, that's the first thing that pops into my mind. Not his matches, not the fact that he was Macho Man's brother, but that so many people have come into this room and told us about Lanny's fellatio skills. That's interesting. Well, you know what? They try and cheap their way out of everything else, maybe even with a little you-know-what, too. A little bit cheaper. It was free. <laughs> All right, as we roll along, how about the March 11th, Saturday night's main event? Headed into WrestleMania, it aired March 11th on NBC. As usual, they taped it way in advance. Reason I bring this one up, going through the results, Brain Busters and the Rockers had a hell of a series of matches. You were working at that point primarily with kind of a slower powers of pain, two big guys. I don't know if you would be on the same house show loop as Brain Busters and the Rockers at that point. but Pro Probably not. No. Did, hearing about their matches and maybe even seeing them at that TV taping, did that make you kind of anxious that you wanted to work with teams like that? Or did it make you want to up the ante with what you were doing with Warlord and Barbarian, where with mm. what Brain Busters and Rockers were doing was so well received at that point? Well, we knew we'd eventually work with all of them. Uh, one, because we were the champions and they wanted to work with us because better, posi money. better position on the card and better pay. Um, and you want the guys to have good matches because you may be in that town next time. Right. So the more good matches there are on the card, word of mouth is when the next card comes, people are going to come and maybe bring somebody. It's like we talked about with the problem with a lot of the house shows nowadays where they continue to advertise talent that doesn't show up. It's not going to help them next time they're in town. Well, I, like I told you, I said that's... That's very surprising to me because with that deliberate was, intent. That was one of the big no-nos, uh, and I'm shocked to hear that. Very it, disappointing. It's your product you're selling, and if you're selling a product that doesn't show up, and it wasn't even supposed to show up, you might get that three or four or five dollars from the ticket, fifty dollars from the ticket, but you're not going to get it next time. I tell you. My, with the, the little ones in my world, the oldest one, he had an interest in it, not a big interest, but an interest in it enough where WWE has been so kind to us with tickets and things like that. Um, I wouldn't have wanted to, have, I never did bring him to a WWE show because, you know, it was the day in bra and panties matches and things yeah. like that. And I really didn't know if that was something I wanted him to see as much as I enjoyed the wrestling. And now you have the little one who's just immersed and wrestling from top to bottom. He absolutely loves every asset of it. He even knows who you guys are from the video games and the action figures that he's had, which I mm. think is pretty cool. But, um, and with him nowadays, the worry isn't, you know, you're going to see panty matches, but you, the guys and the are girls that he's expecting to, to see, they're not even going to be there. Like I said, in October in Boston, Roman Reigns, Ronda Rousey, Samoa Joe, and Rey Mysterio were all advertised in the TV commercial, and they weren't there. And they didn't even offer an explanation. You know, you, I, can, I think that's you, wrong. Can, you can understand one, maybe Roman Reigns, two. I can understand because it was the weekend he got diagnosed with the leukemia. Yeah. But there's no reason for Rousey, Mysterio, and Joe for them not to have acknowledged it. 
Yeah, Roman Reigns was a true card subject to change. That you can't change that. That's real life. Yeah. The other three, if you're sending them off to do photo shoots, I think that's a, a kind of a slap in the face to the ticket buying fans that saw the commercial for this event and they believed that what was going to be there. If they're not injured or don't have a real life emergency, they should be there. And I'm sure that the I'm sure that the fans that bought the tickets are happy about that. No, it didn't go over well at all. <laughs> no, I'm was, just saying. Yeah. Well, you. I believe you. It's just, it's disappointing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Especially, I love nowadays where I get to see it through his eyes when I was his age. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's fun. But, you know, he loves Roman and them. And then when they're not there, it's kind of a dark yeah. cloud. At that show in Amherst we were talking about back right before WrestleMania, um, very poorly attended. And they had po the poster, promotional poster up on the wall, the 11 by 17. And two of the six stars that were advertised on the poster weren't there. So at what point do you take some responsibility? That, that would have never happened before. Unless even, there was a real life emergency. Yeah, even if you're hurt, you got to go. Hey, and look at how many of the guys ran yeah. into that problem. I yeah. think that's going too far. If someone has a legitimate injury or a life emergency, that's when you say, unfortunately, God's subject to change. Yeah. Try and come up with something unique to make it up to the fans. Yeah. But when you have four of the top talents advertised on the show, and three of them are because you want to send them to a photo shoot, I think that's very disrespectful to the fans. That's just my opinion, but I think we agree on it. Well, we do agree, yeah. All right. Well, something we'll agree on is a day of great interest is coming up. It would be April, I don't even remember the date now. April of well, 1989. Don't, I, don't. I don't, maybe it was the second. I, the fifth was WrestleMania 8. You know what? We're going to have to consult the history books. I'm still digesting my wonderful meal <laughs> from my good friends at Gabriella's here on Main Street Melrose. I hear the music playing in the background. I think it's that old WrestleMania theme song. Take a brief time out. We'll come back and talk WrestleMania 5. Stand by. <laughs> I'm Dan Marotti. And I'm John Cena Sr. Let us tell you how the action and excitement of the Millennium Wrestling Federation can help raise cash for your nonprofit cause. Experience the action and excitement of the Millennium Wrestling Federation live in your city throughout New England, the tri-state area, down through the Carolinas, out to our friends in the Midwest and beyond. If your nonprofit organization is looking for an interactive turnkey experience, while putting the fun into fundraising, you've met the perfect tag team partner to work with every step of the way. The MWF offers a variety of packages for groups of almost any size, from our live events at the Boston Garden, the Kowloon Entertainment Dining Complex, and the legendary Suffolk Downs, to high school gyms and function halls. We've presented live events everywhere and anywhere. Since 2001, the MWF mission has been simple. Keep the kids off the streets. Under the leadership of President David Reese, we bring the superstars of yesterday, today and tomorrow to your town. Not for a wrestling show, but an event that features action-packed in-ring wrestling, autograph, pose photo opportunities, Q&A sessions, and so much more. It's the best of sports and entertainment. The week of your event, we can add on to the endeavor with anti-bullying campaigns, library meet and greet reads, youth sport concussion seminars, and more. Our live events are fit for fans of any age from 5 to 95. This fall is part of our new Kids Club program. We offer live event experiences exclusively for the youngest of fans. On the flip side, we can produce a tailor-made event for fans of an older demographic as well. We work with you every step of the way to get the word out to fans near and far on our local television offerings and to over 50,000 fans and growing on our social media platforms. Your success is our success. If your group has had enough of candy bar and wrapping paper sales and has the energy to team with our passionate fan base, bringing the NWF experience to your community is the answer to put smiles on faces while raising cash for your cause. Contact us today to get the ball rolling for your custom-made event that you'll want to bring back year after year to your community. Don't just take it from us. Here are the folks we've teamed up with in the past. 